Revelation chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. Uh, we uh, have been in this series and talking about more than opinions. And uh, we've looked at the seven messages to the seven churches in chapter, Revelation 2 and 3 there. Uh, and as we, we looked at that, you know, it, we saw the, the message that Jesus had to the churches. That, that, that's why we said it's more than an opinion. It's a direct message from him to them, but not only to them, but it's been preserved in the word of God for us. And so when God speaks, when Jesus speaks, it's not just an opinion. It's more than an opinion. And so we, we recognize that. And so we've looked at these messages from him. Now we're going to look at a message about him, the truth about him and, and, and who he is, and just a reminder of who it is that is speaking into our lives, who it is that has given us this accurate, truthful, inspired, inerrant word of God, and who it is that is moving in our midst and with us even today. You know, when Jesus was given the message to the churches, uh, the focus wasn't just on the message to the church. Uh, it wasn't just the message. It wasn't just what the churches were going through, although he says, I, I know your works, and there were messages to the church, but that, that's really not the priority of the messages, although that is part of the message. It's not just the message. It's not just what's going on in the church. Really, the focus of it all was who was Lord of the church. And that's what he was reminding them of in, in bits and pieces there of who he was and because of who he was, what he had to say to them. And, and, and so we, we need to remember that. And really, I mean, if you really think about it and, and just understand this, that everything should be lived out in light of our relationship with Jesus. If you know Jesus, every second of our lives should revolve around him. It really is all about him. And, and that's all that, that will matter. I mean, we, we live in this world, but life's not about this world. Not at all. It's about the one who is worthy. Who is worthy. In the messages that he had to the churches, we saw Bits and glimpses, he, he revealed bits and glimpses of, of who he was. And so we saw in, in Revelation 2 and 3 that he's the one that, that holds the ministers of his church. He uses them, he calls them, he equips them, he, he speaks through them. He, he's the one that not only does that, but he's the one that walks among the churches. He, matter of fact, even this morning, he's, he's walking among us. He is, he is here with us. He's the one who is the first and the last. He was before the church and he'll be be after the church. He was before creation. He'll be after the creation and everything will end at his feet and at his throne. He's the one that died for us and that was raised from the dead. And as it, as it says there in Revelation 2, he's the one that is now alive. Not just that, that he was raised from the dead, but he's now alive and, and working and living among us. He's the one that holds the word of God and, and the word of God that he holds is the sharp two-edged sword that, that speaks to us, that, that convicts us, yes, but also directs us and encourages us and leads us. He's the one that has eyes like flames of fire that sees everything that is going on. He's the one that has feet of bronze, of pure bronze, speaking of the purity of his judgment and how everything is under his feet. He's the one that has the perfect Holy Spirit of God who lives within believers, who indwells the church and works in our midst. He's the holy and true one. He's the one that holds the key of David, symbolizing the cross that is the key that opens up eternal life to us all. He's the one that opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. He is the amen. He's the perfect and true witness. He's the beginning and he is the end and everything ends at his feet. That's who he is. Don't forget who he is. Don't lose sight of who he is. Because I tell you this, he is worthy. 
And I want you to know that as we are worshiping today, in heaven, there is a throne. There is a throne. And there's a king seated on that throne today that's worthy. That is worthy. And one day, we will all be in the presence of that king, worshiping the only one who is worthy. So let's get our practice in. And even though we're not in that throne room today, we are in a throne room today. And everywhere you go, he's on the throne of your heart. And so everything we do, every second of our lives, ought to be lived in worship of the one who is worthy. Revelation chapter 4 just peels back the curtain and reminds us of that throne room and who is worthy. He starts off reminding us uh, that there is a king in heaven, the king of heaven here in Revelation chapter four. And in verse one, we see the call of this king where he says, uh, John is writing these things down on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, after these things, these things being those seven messages to those seven churches, he says, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. There's an open door before John to heaven. For John, that open door is, is for him here as he's writing these things down in Revelation chapter 4. But I want you to know, for us, one day, we will go through that open door. But I want you to understand the door is now open. It is open, not because of anything that we have done, but because of what Christ has done. Now, not everybody goes through that door, but the door is open for anyone that wants to go through the way, which is Jesus Christ. Anyone that wants to go through, through his blood, through, through a relationship with him, through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection, the door is open for us to come into heaven. Salvation is available, and one day we will enter through that open door. If you know Jesus, one day you will. It may be when you breathe your last on this earth and you are transferred, absent from the body to be in present with the Lord. It may be one day when he returns and he raptures the church and takes us to be with him. He goes on in verse one and says, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here. And I will show you things which must take to play, must take place after this. There's a voice that sounds out, and it, it says it sounds like a trumpet. And, and we read in Scripture about a trumpet blast as well. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, he talks about that we will descend with the shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And 1 Corinthians 15, 52 talks about that day when the trump will sound and the dead will be raised in Christ and we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. He's talking about being transferred from here to there. And that's what happens with, with John, but it's a picture of what will happen to us one day. And of course, I'm, I'm talking about the, the rapture and some want to say, well, the raptures, that word rapture is never found in the Bible. Well, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible either, but the truths of the Trinity are there. And although the word rapture is not found here, the, the truths of that are, are, are there. And the, the reality is that however you believe that, that whether you, however you believe about how it will happen and when it will happen and what it will be like after it happens, the Bible says it will happen. There is a day when, the, there is a day when if you believe in Jesus that either you will die and go to heaven and be with him and, and, and transferred in, into that throne room and be with him there or when Jesus comes back, those that are alive then that know him that will be transferred as well. And one day he will say these words either in death or at his return, come up here. Come up here because the door has been made open. Whatever you believe, I want you to know uh, about the rapture and things like that, that heaven has been opened through the blood of Jesus. And what we see here in Revelation chapter 4 is a heavenly scene. 
It is the throne room of heaven. You see, that's what heaven is. According to Scripture, heaven is a throne room. It's not a place with golf courses and fishing lakes and things like that. It is a throne room before Jesus. And I'm so thankful for the call of the king. And not only is it the call of the king, but when we come up there and we enter into that place, we will see the throne of the king. Verse 2 says, immediately I, John, was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit. So that's the, the significance of the, the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is the one that, that <coughs> works and, and transfers us and that heaven is a spirit spiritual reality. It is when, when our faith becomes sight and, and these things that are spiritual realities now, but we can't see with these physical eyes, all of a sudden it will become a, a, a true reality and our, our faith will become sight and we'll, we'll be there with him in the spirit. And then he says, and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. What is a throne? A throne is a seat for a king. And this throne is not a seat for a king. It is a seat for the king, the king of heaven, the king of glory, the king of everything, seated on his throne. Verse 3 describes him. And he says, he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardinia stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. This is just a brief description because we've been reading in the first three chapters. And I mentioned a lot of it in the introduction there about who he is. And so we add some things here. He talks about him uh, being like jasper. Jasper is a clear, pure stone. And that, that just symbolizes the holiness of God. That the one seated on the throne is perfectly holy. It talks sardi sardia stone there is is a, a blood red stone symbolizing the mercy and the love of God that was shown to us through his shed blood. He is a merciful, loving God. And then this emerald rainbow signifies life. The, the green symbolizes life. And, and the rainbow itself is, is God's promise, was God's promise to, to Noah and to us that he's not a destroyer of life. He is a giver of life. And so that symbolizes that the one on the throne is the, listen, he is the holy one who loves loves you unconditionally, and he is the one that gives us new life. New life here through a relationship with him and new life in heaven that will last for all eternity. What a king. What a king. The king of heaven. But not only do we see this king of heaven, and we'll talk more about him in just a moment, but John also describes the host of heaven those that are there in the throne room. And we see, first of all, we see the 24 elders here in verse 4, where he says, around the throne were 24 thrones, and the thrones I, on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting. Now understand, these are not the same thrones. There's only one king of heaven. But there are these, these 24 elders there that are on these thrones. The thrones symbolize not that they are the king, but that they are the family of the king. They're the children of the king. They're part of his family. But, but who are these 24 elders? Let me tell you, these 24 elders represent all the redeemed throughout all eternity. That's who it represents. Some have tried to describe it in this way that it's 24 because there were 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and there were 12 apostles in the New Testament. So it represents all the Old Testament and New Testament saints. But who it does represent is those that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And it don't matter where you lived or when you lived or what you did, the only way to be redeemed is through the blood of Jesus. And so here are the redeemed who have been made children of the king there in the throne room with him. It says they're dressed in white raiment. It's not white raiment that they brought with them. It's right, white raiment that was given them when they got there because they have been purified by the king. They have been, we have been forgiven and made clean and no sin enters the throne room because the blood of Jesus makes us clean. And then not only that, it says that uh, they uh, were clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their head. They have the, these crowns upon their head. Crowns symbolizing that we belong to the, the king, but also symbolizes that 
here on this earth because he redeemed us. We lived for him. We served him. We were faithful to him. We weren't perfect, but we loved him. And we, we honored him with our, our lives here. And so that's why there's, there's people seated there on these thrones and on these, these, with these crowns. It's not because they achieved anything, but it's because the king has given to them. Not only are there 24 elders, but the Trinity is there, specifically in the person of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 says, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Lightnings and thunderings and voices. The, the lightning and thunder are, are usually talking about what's powerful and frightening. And, and there's a recognition that the one on the throne could destroy us like that. He could cast us out of the throne room like that if he wanted to. But he doesn't. Because the one that has the right to destroy, the one that has the absolute right to judge, we are always, listen to me, you are always safe with him. Safe with him. Talks about these voices. We serve a God who speaks. He speaks in heaven. And he speaks now. And when we get to heaven, we will hear him. But the good news is, if you're a child of God, you can hear him now. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. He goes on and says, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We talked about this back in Revelation chapter 3, that the seven spirits, that's the number of perfection. And it is, it is talking about the perfect Holy Spirit who will be there, who is the one that makes us perfect, who is the one that takes us into heaven. He is perfect in all he does, and he, he perfectly fits everything that we need. That's why we are given the Holy Spirit. That is the presence of Christ within us. It is the Holy Spirit of God who is there to provide everything that we need here. And everything that we need to get there is provided not through us, not through our achievements, but through the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us. And then there's a third group of hosts that is mentioned there, and that is these four beasts that are mentioned in verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, before the throne there was a a sea of glass like crystal. And before I get into the beast, let me just go ahead and, and, and address this as well. I love this, this, this sea of glass. The word that's translated sea here literally means a, a laver or a, a basin. It is the same word that was used in the temple for the basin or the laver of cleansing. When you first came into the temple or the tabernacle, there was a laver that was provided there that was, that was uh, where clean water was kept. And whenever the priests came to minister, they needed to wash in this, their, their hands and wash uh, their arms and stuff in this laver for cleansing as they approached and did the, the work of God. Now, the water didn't ever cleanse them or anything. There was, there was a cleansing process, but it's just symbolic of saying, hey, you're fixing to come into the presence of God. You're fixing to come and do ministry in God. Make sure your heart is right. Make sure your, your heart is clean before God before you come. But notice it says here it's a sea of glass. I got good news for you. You don't have to cleanse yourself when you get to heaven. It's already been done. There's a labor there to remind us of our cleansing, but there's no need for cleansing anymore. You, your sins will be wiped clean. And you will, when we get to heaven, we will never have to deal with sin again. Never. Just a reminder of who has made us clean. And by the way, he is worthy. Worthy. But then he talks about there where this, this labor is, this sea of glass. He says, in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. 
And so here are these, these four beasts that are there, these living creatures. Now, they're not monsters. They're, they're living, beautiful creatures. They're angelic beings connected with the worship of God. They are, it's described in other places in the scripture as well. Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah had his vision of God, he saw these creatures flying around the, the throne of God. Ezekiel, in his vision of God, he saw these creatures as well, these cherubim, these angelic beings that are there. Now, notice how they're described here in verse 7. It says, the first living creature was like a lion and the second living creature like a calf and the third living creature had a face like a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now as he's describing them in this way, notice he says like, like, like. He's describing some things in them but they're, they're symbolic of, of, of what is going on here. He describes, he says one was like a lion. The idea of the lion is the idea of the king, of the conqueror, the king of, of, of the jungle. He says one was like a calf. That's the idea. What, do, what does a calf do or a, a cow or an oxen do. They, they, they serve. They're, they're useful beast of, of burden there. And then one symbolizes the, a, a man as it talks about uh, a man signifying humanity there. Now these beings are not human, but, but Jesus is. And, and the beings, although they do serve, they don't serve like Jesus did. Jesus is the one who said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. These beings are not kings uh, or, or conquerors, but, but Jesus Jesus is the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he even talks about like a flying eagle. Now, I'm not sure exactly what all this represents, but the eagle is the most majestic of the birds. And the eagle has better sight than, than any bird there. He can see far, far away, see his prey and come at that. He soars above any other bird. And so the, the, these beings are not the ones that see everything and they can soar above everything, but Jesus does. And you see what's going on. They're flying around the throne. And as we'll see later on, they're giving this worship to God. Uh, but what they're doing is they're not, they're not divine beings, but they're reflecting the one who is as they worship. Jesus is king. Jesus is servant. Jesus took on human flesh. Jesus is above all. And by the way, whenever you worship in spirit and truth and worship Jesus from the heart, we reflect him as well. That's why it's, it's not about your form or what you're comfortable with or your style. It's about giving him honor, reflecting him because he is worthy. He goes on in verse 8 and says, These four living creatures each has six wings and were full of eyes around and within. Now, he doesn't describe anything more than just saying they have these six wings, but Isaiah 6 tells us that the ones, these six wings that they take to and they cover their face signifying their humility before God. They take another two and cover their feet, signifying how unworthy they are to be in the presence of their creator of God. And with two, they fly. They're ready to serve, ready to obey, ready to honor, ready to worship. And it says they are full of eyes. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I think I know what it represents. It's the idea of that all eyes on him. All eyes on him. Never take our eyes off him. All focus is upon him. And when we get to heaven, we'll be able to take in all the glory of God. The host of heaven. The host of heaven. Where do we fit in? We fit in with these 24 elders. And we need to give him the worship that these hosts give him as well, which leads us to the, the third part of this passage, the last few verses here. As we see the king on the throne, we see the host in heaven, but now we see their activity. We see what they are doing. It says there at the end of verse 8, it says they, these four beasts, it says they do not rest day or night. Now, when it says they do not rest day and night, you say, what are they doing? Cooking supper, mowing the yard? What are they, they doing? No, 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 no. There's not going to be any yard mowing in heaven. Amen? <laughs> There's not going to be any supper cooking in heaven. Amen? We get to eat, but we don't have to cook it. 
as a wedding feast to the Lamb that comes one day. But that's not, that's not what heaven is about. What are they doing? They are worshiping day and night, night and day. Their incense is arising before the Lord and worship before him. They can't take their eyes off of him. Everything they do reflects him. And they, they just keep worshiping him, worshiping and worshiping here. They, they do not stop. Matter of fact, right now, while we're here today, they are doing this in heaven. They are worshiping the king of heaven. They were doing it in Isaiah 6 when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. Guess what they were doing? They were worshiping the God in heaven. Even before God created this earth, they were worshiping God in heaven. And by the way, why are they, have they been worshiping God and will worship God for all eternity? Because God never stops being worthy. Never. Not for one second. To worship means to ascribe worth. To give him what he is worthy of. And he is worthy of it all. So let's look at this, this worship in heaven. They are, why, what, are the, what are they saying? What are they showing here? They're showing, first of all, that, that God is worthy because he is holy. So the cry of our heart today should be, you are holy, God. You are holy, the last part of verse 8 says they, they do not rest day or night. This is what they say. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. That's who he is. He, and, and he uses three words. I think it's the idea of past, present, and future. He has always been holy. He is holy right now, just as holy as he's ever been. And he will always be holy. He will never lose one iota of his holiness. He is perfectly righteous, and everything he does is Right. You see, he's not conforming to a standard. It isn't just that he acts holy. He is holy. He is the standard. He is distinctly separate and different than us. And there has never been any sin in his presence other than the time when Jesus bore our sins on the cross. And even then, somehow the Trinity was broken and the Father had to turn away. As Jesus bore your sins and mine. He is holy. You see, that's why sin had to be atoned for. It's because the only way we can be with him is to have our sin removed. And the only way our sin could be removed is for someone perfect to stand in our place and take our punishment. And that's exact, that's the good news. That's the gospel. That's exactly what Jesus did for you. But never forget, he is holy. He says, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. When he says he is Lord, he is saying the one that is on the throne is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. He's the one that created this earth. He's the one that, that walked with Moses. He's the one that parted the Red Sea. He's the one that led the children of Israel into the promised land. He's the one that David prayed to. He's the one that Isaiah saw high and lifted up. He's the one that spoke to the prophets and spoke through the prophets. That's who he is. He's the Yahweh God of the Old Testament. He is the Lord God, God being the creator, Elohim, the creator God who spoke this world into existence. And he's the Lord God Almighty. He is El Shaddai, the all-powerful God, the only powerful God. And he is able to do everything that needs to be done. He is able. And he's the one who was and is and is to come. He has always been holy. He has always been loving. And he always will be. He has always been with us. And we will always be with him if we are redeemed through the blood of Jesus. He's been there all along. That's who he is. He is holy. He's not only holy, but he's also deserving. And that needs to be the cry of our heart is, Lord, you are deserved. You deserve everything. What does he deserve? He deserves everything. Deserving of what? Deserving of everything. Every second of every day. 
So that's what happens here in verses 9 and 10. That's what they're doing. It says, whenever the, the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him, they gave glory, they gave proper worship, they gave him everything that he was worthy of, and all glory goes to the king. They gave him honor. They gave him the proper value. He is the most honorable. He is the, the one that deserves honor above everything else. He is the most valuable. There's no compass, comparison. All honor goes to him. And it says that they gave him thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever. They, gave, uh, they freely gave thanksgiving unto him, overflowing gratitude that they could even be there with him. That yes, he made us and the 24 elders, the redeemed, all of us were saying, and thank you for saving us. Thank you for delivering us from our sins. Thank you for cleansing us. We can all eternity will be saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. He's deserving Verse 10 says, and the 24 elders, that's us, that's the redeemed. They fall down before him who sits on the throne. To fall down on our faces in worship is an act of submission, is an act of full surrender to him. Recognizing we are unworthy, but you make us worthy to be here. You're the one that has provided the open door. You are worthy. And then it says that they fell down before him who sits on the throne in verse 10 and worship him. This word worship, you know what it means? It means to kiss, to adore. And let me tell you right now today, you can come to this altar and fall down before him. And you can bow and you can bathe his feet with your tears and kiss his feet and just pour out your love on him. He's worthy. He's worthy. And then he says there, not only that, but what else did they do? They, they worshiped him who lived forever and ever and then they cast their crowns before their throne. As they're before, if we're before him and we see all that he is and say, what am I wearing a crown for? <laughs> Even though, though he's the one that did it. And by the way, that's our crowns in heaven. They're not things that we do for him. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians says, all these good works that we try to do for him, our best efforts are all wood, hay, and stubble. You see, the crowns, or what he does through us. That's why we die to ourselves. And we give everything to him and his spirit works through us. We don't even do it. I mean, we're, we're a part of it. We surrender to it. He's the one that leads us. He's the one that strengthens us. He's the one that, that gives us the victory. And, and so he does all that in us. And, and it's, and it's a, a purposeful walk and, and saying, Christ, I can't do this. You do it through me. You, do, you be my strength. You help me to do this. And, and as he does that, that's where the crowns come from. And we get up there and say, wait a minute, I didn't do any of this. And we throw them at his feet. To you be all the glory. To you be all the honor. To you be all the thanksgiving and worship. Because he alone deserves it. Is your heart crying today? You are worthy. You are holy. You are deserving. And then the worship continues. As they do declare and purposefully say, you are worthy. Notice the last verse, verse 11. As the 24 elders, all the redeemed, we join. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. And we say, he is holy. And he is perfectly holy. But we know better than anyone he's worthy. As he says, verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. He is worthy. The idea when they say you are worthy, it's the, 
The idea of a scales here, the word that is used here, it's the idea of the scales. It's where you take every good thing, everything on this earth. You put everything, all the beauty of creation, all the beauty of the universe. You take all the power of, the, uh, 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 of everything that has ever been created. You take all the good things that anybody has ever done and you pile up everything that is good, everything that, that, that is beautiful, every, everything that has value, every, every precious ruby, every piece of gold, and you all pile it up on, on this end of the scale and you put Jesus on the other end of the scale, Jesus wins every time. That's how worthy he is. He is beyond description. But let's try to describe him anyway. He is worthy of our worship. When we worship him, we're giving him what, what he is worthy of. And it always falls short But because but, we can't give any more than we have. But I tell you what we can do. We can give everything we have to him. He deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the, the, the value, all the power, every, every effort of our praise. All praise goes to him because as it says here, he, we exist because of him. He, we are, are everything that is created or was created by him. We wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for him. You understand that? He made us. And everything else, we would not be alive if it wasn't for him. He is worthy of our praise. But not only that, but he has brought us here and enabled us to live for him, to have a relationship with him. We exist because of him, and we exist to live for him. Everything in our lives, if you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, every second of every day of your lives ought to be lived for him, all for him. All for him. And if you haven't been redeemed, you need to come and know him. You need to run to him. You need to embrace him. In case you hadn't realized it, let me just put it in four words. Worthy is the Lord. Worthy is the Lord. Worthy. Is the Lord. This Lord is with us right now. And you can come. You can bow on your feet, on your knees, and worship Him. You can come and pour out your affection, your adoration, your tears, your love on Him. You can come and give him what he is worthy of. So let's worship him. Worship him now. Believe him now. Surrender to him now. Obey him now. Praise him now. Serve him now. Because he is worthy.